Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahondro Institute. Hello, and welcome to a special listener question and answer episode of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Over the last four episodes in our Elections in Early America series, you've heard me talk about the Ben Franklin's World subscription program and how one of the perks of this program is that subscribers receive a monthly bonus episode on the last Friday of each month. Well, it's the last Friday of October 2020, and I wanted to let you hear what many of our bonus episodes are like so that you can test drive, if you will, a part of our subscription program. Now, you may recall from the second episode in our Elections in Early America series, episode 285, that we spoke with Terrence Rucker about the history of the first federal election in 1788-89. And as you'll recall, we noted in that episode how the attention of the nation and the world was fixed upon the first federal elections to Congress, because these were direct national elections, which was quite unique in an experiment during this late 18th century. This is why our bonus episode this month is about the United States Congress during its earliest days. In 2018, in episode 202, we spoke with Matt Wasniewski, the historian of the United States House of Representatives, and Terrence Rucker about the early history of the House. We investigated topics like how the First and Second Continental Congresses and Confederation Congress operated, and the types of precedents and procedures early members of the House of Representatives established for later members to follow. In this bonus episode, Matt Wasniewski and Terrence Rucker will answer additional questions you had, such as how early congressmen socialized with each other, how early members of the House campaigned for their offices, and the role of religion and worship in early congresses. And now, without further ado, here's the historian of the United States House of Representatives, Matt Wasniewski, and historical publication specialist, Terrence Rucker. curious about the Speaker of the House of Representatives. It's a really important office that came up a lot during our longer conversation. Plus, when anyone talks about the House of Representatives, they often mention the Speaker of the House. So would you tell us about the office of the Speaker of the House and when and why it was created? Yeah, the office of the Speaker in the Constitution, the Constitution says that the House of Representatives shall choose their Speaker and other officers. And that's it. It's pretty spare guidance. But again, that's because the framers of the Constitution and the early members of Congress were very familiar with the role of a presiding officer in a legislature. Again, going back to all that experience with the colonial assemblies and Articles of Confederation, Continental Congresses, British Parliament. So the Speaker, in some ways, performs the same role as the Speaker in Commons. The original vision was that the Speaker was going to be a nonpartisan presiding officer who would control debate on the floor, a nonpartisan parliamentary traffic cop, we often refer to him as. And certainly that was the role that the speaker played in the early Congresses. But it's a very important office in the sense that it is a constitutional office, but in the institutional sense that the speaker really controls the entire House side of the Capitol. The role of the Speaker is, if you were to enumerate everything that the Speaker is empowered to do, it's a long list, but it includes everything from administering the oath of office to the members on opening day, to calling the House to order, recognizing members to speak or make motions on the floor, presiding over debate in the early Congresses, appointing members to committees, really a tremendously important office. And it evolved over time. The very first speaker was Frederick Muhlenberg of Pennsylvania. And he was chosen for a couple of reasons. One, he had experience as a presiding officer in the Pennsylvania Assembly. He had presided over the Constitutional Convention in Pennsylvania. He was a large man who had a booming voice, 
important in an era when there was no electronic amplification. He came from a mid-Atlantic state, so there was a certain amount of regional buy-in to this new federal government where the president is from the South, the vice president is from New England. So for a couple of reasons, he's qualified and he would be a steady hand in terms of running debate on the floor. And these individuals, they had to know their parliamentary game because in this period, there wasn't a parliamentarian to rely on. So they really had to know how to run proceedings. The office changes as you move out of the 1790s into the 1800s. The seventh speaker of the House is Henry Clay of Kentucky. And he really begins to transform the office into an early version of what the modern office is. He is someone who has a partisan agenda and he's willing to use the speakership to push it. He appoints allies to key committees, which are just then coming into being as standing committees. He uses the rules that in some sense had always been there, but other speakers hadn't used in a partisan manner in terms of recognizing members on the floor or cutting off debate when the minority wanted to pursue a certain issue. So Clay really begins to change the office, and it's a long transformation throughout the 19th century. Eventually, in, in modern practice, the speaker is someone who has really three different roles, presiding officer in, in the chamber, partisan leader, the leader of the majority party, but also a, a member, just like you know, in the modern house, just like the other 434 members, who is elected by a distinct constituency in a geographic district and also has to manage being a uh, member of the House answering to the constituency like all of his or her other colleagues. But it's a tremendously important role. And in the modern post-World War II era, the speaker, of course, is second in line behind the vice president to the presidency. Patty would like to know more about how early congressmen socialized. She notes that we often hear that members who belong to different political parties often get along outside of the House. And she'd like to know how and where early congressmen socialized with each other. During the early era, and I'm mainly focusing on the uh, Continental Confederation Congresses, they met in nearby taverns or boarding houses or hotels that many of the members had stayed in. As Philadelphia and New York were expensive cities even then, some of the richer members would rent or buy homes. Most members sought to live near wherever Congress was presiding, but they also tried to live near colleagues from the same state or region. Many boarding houses had private parlors and dining rooms where members could socialize. However, boarding house life has been compared to living in a nonstop party house in a number of sources. So younger members tended to live there or members who were social butterflies. Older members or those who preferred a quieter space opted for private rooms in homes or hotels. Hotels also had larger spaces for social gatherings, such as balls and elaborate dinners. Delegates traveled in groups between their home cities, home states, and Congress, so a number of them would uh, travel together at any point during the year. Around the region, members and their families could see theater shows in the city they're living in. And once Congress moved to Washington, D.C., they could watch the annual horse races in rural Maryland or Virginia. Some members preferred gambling as it was considered a respectable activity for gentlemen. So a number of the boarding houses and hotels had rooms specially designated for card games where members could talk, interact, and gamble. I might just add to that that there was a lot more time for socializing in a sense because the congressional sessions in those early congresses And really here I'm talking through the 19th century. The House typically would not come into session until the December of an odd year following an election year. So more than 12 months after the election. And it would be an intensive session where the members would be here for five or six months and then go home before the summer, partly because D.C. was an unbearable place to be in the middle of summer with the heat and humidity, but also because many of them had businesses back home in the district that they would attend to. So the sessions were relatively short. Congress didn't meet year round like it does now. So members were in the city. They didn't typically tend to bring families here because travel was so difficult. 
And the floor of the house, too, was a place where a lot of socializing went on. In the modern period, the schedule is so structured that the members, even when they're here in D.C., they're not always on the floor because you can watch proceedings from a TV. And when votes come up, which tend to be clustered at the end of the day anyway, you can run to the floor and vote. And that's really the only time you see the entire membership on the floor. But in the 18th and 19th century, that desk on the floor was your Washington, D.C. office. There were no staff. You didn't have a separate office in a house office building. That was it. And consequently, it was a beehive of activity and a lot more interaction happened on the House floor in that era. Michael has a question about how early members of the House of Representatives campaigned for their offices. What was it like to campaign for office while in office during the late 18th and early 19th centuries? Campaigning in this era involved a lot of footwork, or if you were traveling by horse or by cart. Members campaigned by touring through a district and hosting rallies that not only featured themselves, but featured popular speakers. They could speak on the stump for multiple times a day. Some of these rallies could last for hours on end. One advantage that members in this time period had was that the expansion of newspapers, the expansion of print culture was happening up and down the eastern seaboard and extending towards the west. So candidates could use newspapers and handbills to communicate with a large audience beyond the reach of their voice or beyond the reach of a hosting rally during an election. As political factions became more prominent in the 1790s and became political parties, they started to produce their own newspapers to promote candidate slates. One thing that we see in the 19th century is that as journalism becomes more of a profession, you see actually more journalists moving into politics and running for local and congressional seats. And to some extent, this experience gave journalists quite an edge in creating messages for voters. One famous early race was a house race between James Madison and James Monroe for Virginia's 5th District, which would roughly be about central Virginia, so from a, between the Shenandoah and the Piedmont mountain ranges. And what made this race particularly intense was that Patrick Henry, who was in the General Assembly, he and James Madison were bitter political enemies. And one thing that Henry was able to do was to construct Madison's district so that Madison's home county was surrounded by counties filled with constituents that would be less likely to vote for him and more likely to vote for James Monroe. Madison was in New York with the Confederation Congress when this race took place. He had to race home to the district and he campaigned. This was toward November, December of 1788, going into January of 1789. Madison won by less than 400 votes. But within that time period, Madison was campaigning all over the district. He wrote public letters that were published in newspapers. And he spoke on the stump constantly throughout his home county of Orange, but also two or three other counties, the counties that he could reach within a day's ride. Now, Maggie wonders if there were visitor logs for the House Gallery or any other types of records about who visited and sat in the gallery during early sessions of the House. And if there are visitor logs, what kind of information do they contain about the people who sat in the House Galleries? That's a great question. Sadly, no, there are no visitor logs for the galleries. And the best descriptions probably would come from early newspaper accounts of reporters or correspondents who are sitting in the galleries in terms of describing what happened in them and perhaps some of the people. The House Curator's Office has published at least one or two blogs on the House galleries in the 19th century. We know a little bit more about that in terms of what became known as the Ladies' Gallery, where women could attend and in the 19th century not have to uh, sit on the floor with members or staff, as happened in the old hall of the House, <laughs> wasn't considered quite proper. So they created a Ladies' Gallery. Galleries also, we know in the latter 19th century, in the Jim Crow era were segregated. 
And so I know the curator's office has done some work on that as well. For a history of the press galleries, Donald Ritchie has published the best work on that now, maybe 25 years old, published by Oxford University Press. And then he published a subsequent book on the Washington Press Corps, generally, which does talk about the Congressional Press Corps and the galleries. Brian has heard that both President Thomas Jefferson and President John Quincy Adams attended church services at the Capitol. And he'd like to know more about the role religion and worship played in early Congresses. Well, in Washington, when the Capitol opened, Washington was a very small provincial town, didn't have a lot of big buildings. And subsequently, the House chamber was often utilized for Sunday services by local church groups. Oftentimes, visiting or itinerant ministers would speak in the chamber when the House, always when the House was out of session. In 1806, the first woman who we know spoke in the house chamber, Dorothea Ripley, delivered a sermon. So it was used for church services from the beginning, the house, and this is a tradition that goes back to the Continental Congresses as well, had a chaplain who opened each session with a prayer. Those chaplains in the early Congresses rotated between the house and the Senate. They also were changed out by session within Congress. The chaplain, as an officer of the House, becomes a more permanent figure in the post-Civil War period. There's a brief period in the 1850s where there's a lot of contention about who's going to be chosen as a chaplain. So there's a few Congresses where there, in fact, is not a chaplain. And oftentimes the House chamber, too, until the early 20th century, was used for memorial services or for funerals for members of the House. So in that sense, yes, there have been instances where religion has played a role in the space and in the chaplain's case, in opening proceedings for the House. If you enjoyed that bit of congressional history, be sure you check out our full conversation with Matt and Terrence in episode 202, which you can find at benfranklinsworld.com slash 202. Our subscribers help make the Elections in Early America series possible. Please help us make more series and keep this podcast going by joining the Ben Franklin's World subscription program, benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. As a thank you, subscribers to the program receive ad-free versions of each new episode and monthly bonus episodes similar to the one you just heard. To become a subscriber, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. And Hopefully I'll see you on the last Friday of November 2020 for a subscribers-only bonus episode. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute.